Thanks for coming. It's great to be back. I was here, I think, in 2012. Talked about my last book, How to Create a Mind. And uh, I thought it was an enthusiastic conference then. Uh, I brought a friend this time, uh, <laughs> my daughter. Uh, we did this at Google, and I uh, told the group uh, how long I'd known her, and Amy chided me for revealing her age, so I won't <laughs> make that mistake again. Uh, but I've known her for a number of years. A and <laughs> we've actually had the pleasure of collaborating on a number of creative projects, which we'll talk about. By the way, you can submit your questions on Slido, so think of a good question. And we'll talk about the ways we've interacted. I'll, I'll introduce Amy. Uh, she started a graphic novel as a senior project at Stanford. Finally, three years later, uh, it was finished and everybody was greatly relieved. And she says, now wait, the uh, illustrations at the end of the book are a lot better th than the ones at the beginning because she, she was learning her craft. I'm going to have to redo it. So, which she did. And another three years, it came out and it's been a big hit. Uh, New York Times uh, selected it as an editor's pick. Uh, New York Times cited it as one of the best graphic novels of 2016. Uh, Kirkus Reviews uh, cited it as one of the best memoirs of 2016. Uh, it was a library guild pick, meaning they bought uh, copies of it for all the nation's libraries. Um, and it's had a lot of other uh, critical uh, acclaim. Uh, she has comics in The New Yorker, quite a number of them. We'll share a few of those with you and other publications. Her, her fiction and essays have appeared in many leading publications. She's an adjunct professor of writing and comics. That's a new academic field at Parsons and Fashion Institute of Technology. So great to have you join me. <clears throat> Thank you, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I was told if I'm going to speak to a crowd of this many people that having your father there with you is a, it's an unexpected pleasure, so happy that he's here with me. Um, <laughs> I grew up watching him on stage like, stages like this, and so it's very surreal to be here with him. But it's quite a pleasure, so thank you for having me. Um, I'll introduce this man. You might know him. His name is Ray Kurzweil. Um, he is a director of engineering at Google. Um, he's been there for over four years. He's been awarded the National Medal of Technology, among other awards. He's been inducted into the Inventors Hall of Fame. He has 21 honorary doctorates, honors from three US presidents, a Grammy, and he's written five national best-selling books. So, not bad. Welcome, Ray Kurzweil. <laughs> So I, you, I, you skipped my award in fifth grade. For oh, yeah. a, uh, it was a v virtual reality puppet theater, which was quite <laughs> advanced for that era. <laughs> well, I want to talk more about some of the things that he's done. Unfortunately, I need a clicker. Do the tech people backstage? It's yeah. not on the table. So maybe the tech people can, can come and bring me the, the clicker. Because I want to tell you about my, some of my father's other inventions. Um, so he, I, I can't help but notice that um, a lot of the things that he has worked on, even though he's known as a tech person and um, he's renowned as a futurist and an inventor, um, a lot of the things that he has worked on, thank you, there it is, <laughs> yay, thank you tech. <laughs> Okay, so a lot of the things that he has worked on over the years have actually had to do with the arts. Um, so this is my father, age 17, 1965, on I've Got a Secret, um, which is a show where um, someone would come on and do something and there was a secret that the panelists had to guess what, what, um, you know, what that secret was. And so my father came out and he played a piano piece and the secret was, what was the secret? 
Well, I, I said I built a computer, and Steve Allen said, that's impressive, but what does it have to do with the music? And I said, well, the computer composed the music. So. Yeah, so, <laughs> so there we go. It's one of his first inventions, a uh, musician, an artist, robot. <laughs> so, okay, so then a few years pass, and he creates the Kurzweil music synth synthesizer, which a lot of you must be familiar with. Um, okay, so another kind of robot artist. Uh, yeah, well, uh, your grandfather, whom you did not have the opportunity to meet because he died when I was 22, was a famous musician, and he could not hear his compositions without late night arguments with funders to hire an orchestra. Then I would stay up late one night with him running off scores on a mimeograph machine. That's probably before most of your time, but some of you may remember it. And finally, he'd get the opportunity to hear his orchestral composition. Now a kid in a dorm room can hear an orchestra, a jazz band, a rock group on her uh, with a MIDI keyboard and sim music simulation software on her notebook computer. Uh, so our creativity has definitely been enabled by technology. Mm -hmm. You also have a number of inventions that facilitate literacy and facilitate appreciation of great literature, which is close to my heart. So here we have the Kurzweil reading machine, another one of your most well-known inventions. Um, yeah, helps people appreciate the arts, appreciate great books. Yeah, I mean, people have asked whether I have a connection to blindness. Uh, my connection actually is to pattern recognition and I have a whole thesis that human thinking is based on pattern recognition. Our neocortex, which is the part of the brain where we do our thinking, it's the outer layer, uh, consists of 300 million little modules, each of which can recognize a pattern. So recognizing patterns uh, is the <coughs> essence of, of human intelligence, and they're organized in a hierarchy. And we got an additional amount of neocortex, you might remember two million years ago, uh, if you remember, we were walking around without these big foreheads, and then we got these big foreheads, and that was an additional quantity of neocortex. So what did we do with that? We put it at the top of the neocortical hierarchy because we were already doing a very good job of being primates. And that, so the, the hierarchy of these pattern recognition modules got higher. As you go up the hierarchy, issues get more interesting, more intelligent, more creative, and that was the enabling factor for us to invent Music, no primate does music, uh, language, art, science, conferences on culture. Uh, <laughs> and so my thesis on human intelligence is this hierarchy. The arts exist at the top of the hierarchy. Computers are now, and artificial intelligence are now helping us at least be more creative. So as I mentioned, my father couldn't even hear his compositions before we created this kind of technology. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, we're starting to see computers do more and more creative things. An example of this that you're involved with, um, another artistic invention of my father's, Kurzweil, um, cybernetic poet. Here's an example of a poem that the cybernetic poet wrote after reading works of, of literature and poems by other authors. And it's actually very interesting that that's the model for the cybernetic poet, reading lots of different uh, works by great poets and then imitating, because that is how humans learn also. You yeah. know, I teach literature and that's how I have my students learn to read and imitate. So um, you're probably on the right track with that one. That's, <laughs> that's how we're teaching AI. Um, yeah. And one of the reasons I came to Google is we have lots of examples of language. We have billions of documents, maybe trillions, and uh, it's through reading that and trying to find the patterns uh, that AI is gradually learning, uh, at least what to make sense of language and ultimately to be creative. And also, we'll show you some intriguing examples of, of computer creativity based on the current state of the art. Yeah, here's another project that um, you were involved with. This is Harold Cohen's yeah, this Aaron, is, cybernetic artist. Yeah, this was done by Harold Cohen, who recently passed away. It's probably the best example of cybernetic art. Uh, he actually used his own insights into art and programmed them into the computer. And every painting is, is different, has a style, but the style actually has evolved over the years. Mm -hmm. 
He was going to create uh, cybernetic artists A through Z, and he started with Aaron. <laughs> he never made it to B. Yeah. Oh, well. So there's, a, there's another artistic invention of sorts that you're um, partially responsible for creating. This one was a, a <laughs> collaboration with your wife, Sonia Kurzweil. Um, I had relatively little to do with it for the first nine months, but <laughs> uh, I've had some input f since then. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'm not a robot, but I am an artist. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some debate about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's really no way to prove it, actually. So. <laughs> So I'm curious, how do you feel about me being an artist? Did you have other, other plans for me? <laughs> well, you really followed in the footsteps of our family. Uh, you didn't meet my father, as I mentioned, but you did meet your grandmother, who recently passed away about a year ago, who was a very talented artist. And I think you get her, your art skills from her. Uh, we have a noted family, which I think will talk about goes back to your great great grandmother who started the first school in Europe for that provided higher education for girls so my family has always celebrated the arts and learning and creativity yeah um, so I'm going to talk a little bit speaking of me as an artist about my book which you guys can buy <laughs> I'll be signing books at 2 p.m. by the book, book atrium. Yeah, the, uh, just to introduce it, it's, it's a great uh, graphic novel, if I say so, uh, myself, about my daughter. Uh, but it, as I mentioned, it got, it's gotten a lot of acclaim. It's a memoir, a graphic memoir, about three generations of women, her, her own coming of age, her mom, and her mother's mother, who was one of the little kids in the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, for those of you familiar with that history, they got to a point where they ran out of food and the only way they could get food is by knocking out a few bricks in the wall and sending children out to steal food from the farms, uh, which needless to say was a dangerous mission. She was one of those children at age 12. Then one day her father said, this time don't come back because he had an accurate premonition that there was the ghetto is going to be destroyed. So it tells her story, which is a gripping uh, story. It has a lot of pathos about the Holocaust, but the book has also humor about the same woman and the idiosyncrasies of this grandmother called Bubby uh, mm -hmm. uh, and the role she plays in Amy's life and Amy's own coming of age, which has a bit of humor in it. I don't know if that was intentional. <laughs> um, very hard to pull off uh, combining the Holocaust and humor. Very few works of art do that. Uh, the movie It's a Beautiful Life did that because the father used, in that movie, the father uses humor to keep his son sane. Uh, but Amy really pulls it off. Uh, it's a very beautiful, moving book, so I recommend it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, humor, I think humor does keep us sane. I feel that humor is actually quite connected to, tra to tragedy. Um, but yeah, I want to tell you a little bit about my book. Um, oh, it, it sparkles. That's one thing about it. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so there are, there, I, I mentioned that this book is about, or my father mentioned that this book is about three generations of women, me, my mother, my grandmother. So not his side of the family, although I'm, I'm getting there, don't worry. Um, but my father does have a role in this book. He is called upon to um, vanquish monsters under the bed and things like that. So how, how did I do? You did well, yeah. <laughs> so thank you for playing that role. Um, but the book is really about women. It's about myself, the artist, my mother, who is a psychologist, and um, my grandmother, who I call Bubby, um, and I tell, I tell her story, as my father alluded to, her story of surviving um, the Holocaust and leaving Wars the Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, one of the reasons why I was so compelled to tell this story is because of my grandmother's voice. Um, she's got a really compelling voice, and she can't be here, unfortunately. But I do have, um, with the help of technology, I have an animated book trailer that I'd like to share with you. 
Um, and you can hear my grandmother talking about this project and get to know her a little bit. So if you want to know more about her, then you can, uh, you can buy the book. So here we go. So you understand what we're doing? I understand. You ask questions, so I just say I'm Lily Fenced and I'm a Holocaust survivor. Okay, so tell everyone about yourself. Huh? <laughs> How do you feel about being a character in my book? I love it. Being with big hair, and <coughs> it feels like a caricature. Kar How you pronounce it? So, you know, but why did you pick that? I have no idea. Who would like to know for an old Jewish woman to, is it gonna be successful? Sonia is a PhD child psychologist for children. I raised as much as I could. Amy has a heart as gold. She was my first granddaughter and she wants to feel what I went through. One thing I would like to get married. Look at family should stick together. Friends are friends, but that's your flesh. If you have a good family life, you have a good life. You survive. Do you want to sing something? You want me to sing in Jewish? Can I sing in Jewish? <coughs> so I, I will say, I've, I've heard these stories of uh, my mother-in-law for decades, uh, and they came out as little disconnected fragments, not organized in time or cause and effect, and Amy really put it all together. Uh, it's for the first time I actually understood this moving narrative. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it was interesting getting her stories. I was given her stories by my mother um, as a actual, actually a document that she, um, it was a transcription of a history, oral history recording that she'd done with a historian. And it had in this very fragmented way pieces of her story and I had to order it and, and put it together. And I did learn certain things. I mean, I learned about her life before the war, which I didn't know about. Um, I learned about uh, how she snuck through the hole in the wall around the ghetto. Um, and I, I didn't just want to tell a story about um, the Holocaust, not that uh, those stories aren't important, but it, it felt like at this point I wanted to talk about how this history continues to be relevant to the present. Um, so I tell anecdotes about my own life and my mother and I, the relationships of the women. And I talk about, you know, different ways in which I had curiosities. Um, even though I grew up in comfort, I had curiosities and anxieties about these dark things. And it was interesting to, to reflect on the Holocaust and how my connection to this history felt, um, like it felt like it caused me some anxieties, but it also seemed to me that the history was very distant. I think because I was so accustomed to watching films about it. Um, and so in, in a way I wrote this book in order to make this history feel closer to me um, because I actually think that that was an interesting way to feel less anxious about it. Yeah. An, an interesting uh, <clears throat> technological reflection on this is whether or not a computer could understand comics. And it's an interesting question. Uh, we're making progress on that. Five or six years ago, the big accusation against my field was you guys can't even tell the difference between a dog and a cat. Mm -hmm. uh, turns out that's actually pretty subtle. And we had been developing neural nets. And the essence of a dog and a cat is at level 15. Because of a math problem, we couldn't go beyond three or four levels. And that was solved actually just recently. Now we can go to 100 levels, and indeed, we can tell the difference between a dog and a cat in thousands of other categories, and even whether something is a sunset or reflects a ghetto, and it can make certain inferences about a scene. But one thing we can't do yet, suppose you had a comic panel where you had a dog, and it's, it's 
you can see that it's moving towards a man, and then the next frame, you see the, the man on the floor. We can all easily make the inference that the dog knocked the man over. That's something that computers can't quite do, <coughs> is make that kind of inference. And that requires actually a lot of world knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's so obvious, we take it for granted, the fact that a dog can pounce on you, that it's heavy enough to push you over, uh, and that if a dog is headed uh, full steam towards a person, that person's probably going to fall over. Uh, that's what we're trying to teach computers now. And so computers actually have to read a lot of stories and understand these kinds of inferences. And we're making progress, but we're not there yet. Yeah, Scott McCloud has a book called Understanding Comics. And he talks about that process of knitting static images together. I mean, unlike film, where that process happens for you. When you're reading a comic, it's your own brain that's knitting images together to animate the story. And he calls that closure. Um, so that is a unique problem. And I think we take for granted how much our brains are doing that work yeah. when we read comics and when we read printed text, too. And an another interesting thing that a, that a computer would have to do in order to read comics is you know, when an artist is reflecting um, the world around them visually, Comics are unique because you get this inner world of the narrative and the voice, and that really puts you into a character's perspective, especially in graphic memoir. You, you still have writing. But then you also have that outer world, which is the visualization. But that visualization is not objective. The visualization is inflected with the perception of the artist. Like, when I draw myself, I'm revealing something about how I feel about myself based on the choices that I make about how to represent myself. And the same is true, you know, when I draw you, I'm, I'm making certain choices about um, how to re represent you, and that reveals something about my perceptions. And so all those subtleties are being communicated in drawing. So not only would a drawing of a cat maybe not even really look like a cat, but it's also revealing something that the artist is feeling. There's like emotional content in drawings. And I wonder, I mean, that's also high up there in the, the hierarchies of well, the brain. Well, it's at the top of the neocortical hierarchy, yeah. and we're not quite at that high level, but we're beginning to understand language. I think understanding comics is even more difficult, because you've got to integrate these subtle inferences, both about the emotional inner state, and just the literal things like the fact that the dog pushed the man over. Uh, even a simple thing like that, we can't quite do yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're moving up the hierarchy, uh, so we'll get there. By 2029 is my date. So. Really, 20? <laughs> okay. So I have, I'm like not out of a job until 2029. Well, no. I mean, my my <laughs> idea is we're going to uh, make ourselves more intelligent by merging with artificial intelligence. That's okay. its primary role. You know, you see these uh, AI dystopian futurist movies where it's the AI versus a brave band of humans for control of humanity. That's not what we see today. We don't have one or two AIs in the world today. We have several billion of them. There's hundreds of them in this room, and they are already brain extenders. How many people could do their work or get their education today without these brain expanders? Uh, and they're not yet in, inside our bodies and brains. That'll happen. I think that's a, not an important distinction. Uh, but that's why we've always created tools. You know, we couldn't reach that fruit at that higher branch. So a thousand years ago, we created a tool that extended our reach. Who here could build a skyscraper with their bare muscles? So we have tools that enable us to expand the reach of our limbs and our muscles. And we're doing the same thing with our mm. intellectual tools. So by 2029, I'll be the best graphic novelist who ever lived. Yes, well, yeah. you'll stay at that uh, leading cutting edge, yes. OK. <laughs> so um, I want to ask you about your some of your transformations in your creative projects. Um, just going to fast forward through these images. These are examples of different well, these artistic are, are interesting because these are computers AI. that studied uh, the works, let's say, of Van Gogh and other artists, and then were given a, a picture of a row of buildings, just a photograph, and were asked to repaint them in the style of Van Gogh or Picasso, or Munch. Um, so. Yeah. So I, I, so I want to ask you. are starting to be creative. Yeah. You recently wrote a creative project without merging with a machine, though, on your, with your own human brain. You wrote 
you wrote something creative recently, and you are, have written many nonfiction books and have a history, although you did write poetry in college, which I have read, which is interesting. Yeah, that but, <laughs> <laughs> but you recently wrote a creative project. You recently wrote a novel called Danielle. Do you want to tell people about Danielle? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think writing is a form of invention. I decided to be inventor when I was five. I was actually inspired by a mechanical typewriter by uh, my grandmother, uh, and that inspired me to, I mean, it was a magical machine. You could actually take a blank piece of paper and turn it into something that looked like it came from a book. That was magical. Uh, but unlike parlor magic, where if you see how the magic works, the magic goes away, I could see how the magic worked, and it still was magical. And that inspired me to be an inventor. But it also inspired me to be a writer, and I actually wrote a book at age seven on that typewriter. Mm. Um, about a boy who travels around the world in the back of a goose. But so recently I've written this, as you noted, a number of nonfiction books. That enables me to invent with the technologies of the future. We don't have the technologies of 2035 yet, but I can imagine what they will be like and then create inventions at least by writing about them and describing how they would work. Um, fiction is also a form of invention. You're inventing actual people, mm -hmm. and successful novels create living people that people relate to emotionally as if they were real. Mm -hmm. So for many years, I was having this fantasy about this young girl, Danielle, and the remarkable exploits uh, she had. And this is how I would fall asleep, by imagining uh, Danielle. I think I imagined myself as Danielle. This is what I would like to be when I grow up, isn't it? Yeah. Precocious 12 year old girl. Mm. Um, <laughs> so I f I'd say six years ago, I decided, I, well, I should write these down just because so, I'm going to forget these fantasies. Uh, so, so at the end of a, the vacation, I had a 70 page novella, Danielle, and I've kept rewriting it. That's how I write a book. I write it as a small kernel and then expand it. Uh, one of my main guides in doing this is, was uh, my daughter, who was my fiction coach, mm. uh, and also taught me what a young girl would actually be like. Uh, so several of the drafts, I'm now on draft eight, um, were guided by Amy. Uh, this will be published next year by Woodfire Press, uh, and it has another unique feature, which is a companion book which is actually three times the length of the novel. The novel is 65,000 words. This is basically a glossary. It's about 200,000 words. I tagged 300 entries, everything from string theory to Mei Tse Tung uh, to female genital mutilation to uh, peace in the Middle East. And then I have an essay, 300 essays on these issues, giving my own twist and Danielle's own twist on these issues. It's called a guide for superheroines and superheroes. It actually guides you how you can be a Danielle. Uh, and Danielle might seem remarkable in all the things she does, but the, my main point, and I say this in the foreword, is anyone can be a Danielle by applying their mind and having the courage to actually carry out their ideas. So this is a little uh, virtual reality trailer we'll show it to you in 2D. Um, that gives you an introduction uh, to the book. Uh, it's illustrated by Amy. It, it follows Danielle. It's narrated by Claire, who's her sister, who's a black girl from the Haitian earthquake. She's adopted by this family in Los Angeles. And then two years, when, when uh, Claire is six, and two years later, Danielle is born. And Claire tells the story of her remarkable sister from zero to 22, and it has 22 illustrations by Amy, one for each year of Danielle's life. So in this trailer, Danielle, who's now 15, uh, is uh, thinking about her life and how she got to this point, because she's about to accept having been elected uh, the chairman of the Communist Party of China uh, at age 15. Uh, <laughs> And as she reflects upon her life, you'll see Amy's illustrations showing different points in her life. So let's, let's take a look at that.
This is intended to be seen in virtual reality. seem surprised because, well, I'm a 15-year-old girl from Los Angeles. I suppose part of me is surprised too, but the other part has been expecting it. It's been a complicated path to get here. I started out innocuously as a child that didn't talk. I didn't really see the point of it, at least until I had something to say. I loved books. I taught myself to read, but I didn't want people to know. I purposefully held my book upside down to throw my sister Claire off track. Claire, by the way, was an orphan from a Haitian earthquake that mom and dad adopted two years before I was born. Well, I finally joined the conversation and said my first words when I was two. Mom was shocked at my insights into the word onomatopoeia and dropped the blueberry dessert all over Claire and me. But dad took it in stride. I wasn't very good at making friends. Well, at least the other kids had a good time at my fourth birthday party. I finally made my first friend when I was six in Zambia, halfway around the world. I went there with Claire to help with the drought. We ran into a lot of predicaments, like feuding worlds. By my calculation, we solved one third of 1% of the water problem. The world discovered me at eight when I was debuting at the country music festival. But I learned that fame has a steep price. The peace conference that Claire organized in Libya turned out to be kind of a disaster. I ended up protecting the rebels and my sister with software viruses from our outpost in the Libyan desert. Negotiating a Middle East peace agreement was more complicated than I expected, but I had help from a wise rabbi in Brooklyn. Tragedy struck when I was 14. I discovered that there is an unrelenting finality to death. Well, I'd better gather my thoughts on my acceptance speech. I'm the first teenage girl to be elected chairman of the Communist Party of China. And I'm not even Chinese. I have to say, I'm not really comfortable with that title of chairman. How about chairwoman? No, that doesn't make sense either. I'm only 15. Someone suggested I'd be just called chair, but <laughs> I'm not a piece of furniture. I've got it, chair girl. It's interesting to me that you did this trailer in virtual reality, because I think there's a connection between virtual reality and fiction. Um, and you talked about wanting to enter the perspective. You imagined yourself as Danielle when you were first conceiving of this, of this book. I think in a way, uh, virtual experiences are, um, they can happen in a lot of different ways. So we can have them in this full immersive way and we can also have them in, um, in fiction. And so I'm curious, um, why did it feel important for you to have this experience through the perspective of a female character? Was that um, something you thought a lot about? And was it hard to enter a female perspective? And why did you want to do it? Well, it's a good question. Uh, I find women more interesting than men. <laughs> uh, so why not be a woman if you're going to be in virtual reality? We'll talk about a project actually where uh, we did exchange roles. I became a woman, you became a man in virtual reality. Mm -hmm. Using the primitive virtual reality of 2001, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but I was trying to make the point that you can be someone else uh, in virtual reality. A couple could become each other, for example, in a virtual environment. And these technologies are, are coming where that'll be easy and realistic to do. It brings up the issue of identity uh, and can you really be someone else in a virtual environment. Uh, brings up, makes me think about this case of Rachel Dolezal, who 
uh, controversial issue where this woman claimed to be black and she clearly had been born white, but she identified with being black. And without getting into the details of that, the issue is can you really take on a different identity? And so uh, many people didn't like her claim because that she had not uh, brought, she had not experienced uh, having been black and she could always be white and so forth. And so can you really be someone else? You can look like someone else in virtual reality, but th does that really affect your identity? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm curious about that too. This is, this is the stills from the project that we did together in um, 2000, when was it? 2000. 2001. Uh, 2001, yeah. So we, using the primitive technology then, my father became this female in virtual reality, and I became uh, three, so my identity was spread out across bodies. I became three different males. Three, three copies of Richard Saul Werman, who was at that time the imp impresario of TED, uh, a, who's not known for his hip-hop kicks, but she, so I, uh, we both had magnetic sensors in our clothing. As we moved, the computers picked up our movement. I was turned into a life-size, somewhat realistic, at least for that era, uh, real-time transformation into this female rock singer. I tried to pick someone that was very different from myself just to make this point that you can be someone else. Amy was turned into Richard Sol Werman. A band came on stage. I sang White Rabbit. Uh, she was the backup dancer. Richard Sol Werman was not known for his hip-hop kicks. Uh, her, her avatar was very realistic. But the point was you can be someone else in virtual reality, and we will see that as virtual reality becomes much more immersive, realistic, and ubiquitous in the years ahead. Yeah, yeah, but back to this question of can you really be somebody else? I mean, you, re you mentioned Rachel Dolezal, somebody who in real reality decided I want to take on a different race, and that was controversial. And I, I think the reason for me why that was controversial is because um, it has to do with the nature of identity being about much more than just your experiences and the way that you look. Um, I recently saw the James Baldwin documentary, and there's this line that really resonated with me, a very simple line about identity. Baldwin said, we are our histories. Um, so we are not just who we are right now in this moment. Um, we are not just how we look. We are the kind of legacy culturally and biologically um, or technologically that we tap into. And so to, to go into a, whether it's a real environment or a virtual environment, and just to say that you really are this other thing, um, you're, you're rewriting your own history. And I don't know if that's really possible. And, well, and also, is it desirable? I mean, it was interesting. This 2001 experience, I would look into the cyber mirror, and instead of seeing what I had always seen in the mirror, I saw this young girl, and it was quite liberating. I was like, whoa, this physical body I have is just one manifestation. People identify so much with their physical body, uh, whereas you could actually be someone else. Now, uh, that has not been the case up until recently. We have the generation now growing up where everybody, I walk through the airports and everybody from two on up is on their devices. Ultimately, people will grow up in virtual reality and will have that experience growing up being a variety of people and having different roles. And I think we will become more flexible in our cultural identities. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it seems to me like um, I, we'll have to have new language for identity. We'll have to have, and maybe it already exists and someone can clue me in, but it's like um, you, there's you know, your historical, your biological identity, and I think that that can't stop being important. But you, you, we might come to a place where, um, you know, your current identity has some new way of defining itself. I mean, this is, I think it's going to be very significant. Right now, it's just kind of right at the fringe, and not everybody's even ever been in virtual reality, but I think that will become ubiquitous. Augmented reality will become ubiquitous, and our sense of reality, and including our own identity, I think will become more flexible. Mm. Well, one of the things I've written about is that you, you can be safer in virtual reality because mm -hmm. you can always hang up on the experience. That 
the telephone is kind of a virtual reality, at least as far as talking is concerned. You could be with someone else in a virtual space, even if you're hundreds of miles apart, at least as far as talking is concerned. And you can always hang up on the phone call, something you can't always do in real reality. Uh, I thought it was interesting, I don't know if you noticed, there was a story about this woman, she went to a VR, a multiplayer game called QVR, Q-U-I-V-R, and she talked, first of all, her experience was, wow, this is incredible, it was such a revelation that she could stand at the edge of mountains and then leap from one cliff to another, and it was, uh, she found it liberating. And then she was reported being assaulted by another avatar, and so I thought this was interesting. I mean, I, I, I took her uh, report uh, seriously and at face value, and I had not really considered that you could be assaulted in a virtual environment. So she did finally hang up, I mean, after being chased around the virtual cliffs by this uh, other male avatar, uh, she ripped the headset off and uh, hung up on the experience, but not before she had had a negative experience and it lingered with her for uh, a long time. Mm. Uh, so virtual reality actually is real reality. You can't say, oh, that phone conversation we had yesterday, oh, that was virtual reality. That loving sentiment I expressed to you or that complaint I made about you or that agreement we made, those weren't real, that was just virtual reality. These are real experiences. And of course you can have a negative experience on the phone. Yes, you can hang up, but maybe not always in time. Mm. It's interesting to reflect on um, a future where our, our identities might change and might get further away from our histories, something that you are very um, interested in. But you are also somebody, as much as you're interested in the future, you are also somebody who's very interested in the past. Um, this is a picture of your father, uh, the musician that we mentioned at the beginning of our talk. And you have this storage unit where you've been saving all of your father's things. Why are you doing that? Well, uh, this project was documented in Barry Ptolemy's movie, Transcendent Man, which is about my life and ideas. And it's principally about this project I have to bring my father back. Uh, and Transcendent Man actually was the inspiration for a Black Mirror episode, and that actually inspired somebody recently to create a chatbot uh, based on the writings of a dear departed friend and mm. they didn't feel that the chatbot was the friend but they actually felt a deep satisfaction that they could in some way converse with this person who had uh, they would very much like to visit with again so the state of this project is I have gathered and uh, in fact my father had the same uh, feeling I have all of I have hundreds of boxes of my documents until they all went electronic and my father kept all of his music his scores, his photographs, movies, letters to my mother, telephone bills, uh, and I've got dozens of boxes of, of his uh, reflecting his life and his thoughts, his creativity. Uh, so I imagine an AI in the future, uh, I think that's something we could actually do in the near future in terms of a chatbot, but ultimately we could create a very realistic avatar <coughs> in virtual reality or beside us in augmented reality or even in a robotic form as a physical avatar that would represent my father and who would pass a Frederick Kurzweil Turing test. And that test is getting easier and easier because that would mean that he'd be convincing as Frederick Kurzweil to the people who, who know him. But having died almost 50 years ago, that's becoming an easier and easier test because our memories of him are fading. Hmm. Uh, but this will be a way to bring him back, and I think I've talked to people about this. People actually would love to do this, e even if it isn't fully realistic, to hmm. have an AI bring back uh, a loved one that they could interact with. So history is alive and well in the future, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, I think we want to end with some humor. Yeah, well, well, we'll know what Amy's working on another graphic novel. Her first one is about herself, her mom, and her mother's mother. And this one, I think, to some extent, is about herself, 
her father and her father's father. So. That's right. Yeah, stay tuned. Um, so yeah, before we take questions, we want to share with you guys some tech-themed cartoons of mine. This is the first cartoon I had in The New Yorker, just to illustrate the point that um, I like making fun of my father. It's the <laughs> so he started working at Google, and I was inspired. Um, and this is my s one of the next cartoons I had in The New Yorker. Yeah, a little bit easier than a human Turing test, but... Yeah, you don't have to do much. I got a robot cat for Hanukkah for my father. Okay, so then the next ones are... Um, <laughs> these have not been published. So judging based on how much you laugh, I will know <laughs> whether or not they have a future. This one, like, I'm not sure. Art and technology, you know. <laughs> I know all of you have this away message on your email right now. So. coming for our jobs. <laughs> That's a dance joke. <laughs> Lazy robots. <laughs> I know that's not where we're going, don't worry. <laughs> um, okay, the, the very last cartoon I'll show you, the, this one was published in The New Yorker. And I guess the, the last thing I want to ask you, Dad, is um, do you ever feel, you're a pretty large and significant person, but do you ever encounter doubts? And what do you do to transcend? Uh. Well, we're all f familiar with the imposter syndrome, so that comes up for me in cocktail parties. Uh, so I was never good at cocktail parties. Like, how do I break in this conversation? I'm going to say something stupid, and these people don't know me. So in recent years, at least the cocktail parties I happen to go to, people know me to some extent, and then they come up with questions, and then there's people gathering around me and I look like I'm popular at this cocktail <laughs> party. Uh, but they don't really know I'm actually not good at cocktail parties. So, um, <clears throat> so that's a bit of the imposter syndrome. Yeah. So to get over our imposter syndrome, what do we do? Uh, grin and bear it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so on that note, uh, on the off chance that anybody has submitted questions, why don't we use our remaining time? So wh why don't you read them? <laughs> Not wearing my glasses. <laughs> okay, so we've been seeing a lot of interesting real-time use cases with AI and deep learning with less than a quarter second, oh no. Latency. Latency. Well, I'm like, need will, technology right now. Will computation in the network drive AI? Will computation in the network drive AI? Well, definitely, the, I think network means the cloud, and the cloud is driving everything. Uh, I believe we ultimately will connect our brains to the cloud and actually to synthetic neocortex in the cloud and make ourselves smarter. That's the application I see for AI. But I, I like to point out that, you know, this device is actually several billion times more powerful per dollar than the computer I used when I went to MIT. I went to MIT in the late 60s because it was so advanced it actually had a computer. 
But that's not the most interesting thing about this. This can make itself a million times smarter yet by connecting wirelessly and seamlessly to the cloud. And so the most interesting things it does, like a search or a translation, doesn't take place in this little rectangle. It takes place in the cloud. Uh, and we're, so at, at Google and other places, we're constantly uh, using thousands, millions of computers. Uh, that's why a computer today can tell the difference between a dog and a cat and do a lot of other exciting things. And we're going to see computers doing uh, pretty convincing things with language. <coughs> we won't get to human levels until 2029. But computers can, a million computers can gather together and become one supercomputer. Uh, and then they can become individuals again. And we'll do that as individuals. We will. I mean, we do that through language. That's why we invented language, so we can actually transcend our 300 million neocortical modules by having multiple people work together, sharing ideas through language. Uh, we'll have more powerful ways of doing that as we can actually connect directly to the cloud. But we do it indirectly through these devices today. The next question is, will there ever be a boy who can swim as fast as a shark? What about a girl? <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, I mean, there are robotic devices now that can, uh, like you've seen in the movies, enable you to pick up an extremely heavy object, and the military uses these. And um, so, I don't know about the shark application. I'm not sure there's <laughs> of a market for that. But um, it's been some time since you wrote the singularity is near. How are your predictions tracking? Well, uh, you can, if you Google how my predictions are faring, Ray Kurzweil, uh, you'll see a 150-page essay uh, that tracks 147 predictions I made in the age of spiritual machines in 1999, about the year 2009. Uh, they were about 86% correct. Uh, the ones that were wrong weren't all that wrong. Like one of the ones that was wrong was we'll have self-driving cars. It's off by a number of years. Uh, there were some experiments in 2009, but I wouldn't say we had them then. Um, but the predictions also in Singularity Near are tracking quite well. <coughs> when I finally get this novel out, uh, uh, later in 2018, uh, Viking will publish The Singularity is Nearer, uh, where I will talk about how the predictions in my 2005 book, Singularity is Near, fared. Uh, and update them, but we're actually doing very well. Uh, there's been a lot, all the exciting things that have happened in AI, like telling the difference between a dog and a cat and thousands of other images and playing Go and driving cars and uh, understanding language to some extent. For example, Jeopardy, which is already six years ago, which is actually a pretty complex game, have happened since that time. People have tended to dismiss AI as, yeah, it can do things better than humans, but in very narrow areas. Well, Jeopardy's not so narrow. Driving a car is not so narrow. Go is considered a game requiring deep understanding of, of patterns. Um, so uh, the confidence that we'll have human-level AI is growing. When, when my book 19, uh, in 1999 came out and I said 2029 for human-level intelligence, Stanford organized a conference on this startling prediction. And the consensus of the AI scientists was hundreds of years if ever. 2005, on the uh, 50th anniversary of the 1955 conference at Stanford, actually 1956 conference at Stanford that gave AI its name, uh, there was a, a poll taken and the consensus was 50 years. Now the consensus is maybe 30 or 40 years. So my prediction is getting closer to the consensus view, but not because I'm changing my view. And it's also not because people are necessarily adopting the exponential viewpoint. I agree it'll take 40 years at today's rate of progress to get to human level AI, but we'll make 40 years of progress at today's rate of progress in the next 13 years because the rate keeps accelerating. And that's something that people don't internalize. Um, are there any recent technological inventions or trends that have surprised you despite your predictions? Well, I'd say <clears throat> that 
I'm all, part of me is always surprised, uh, even if I predicted something, because uh, it's so remarkable. And I still have a linear intuition. You know, when our brains were evolving, the problems we had uh, to solve were linear ones. You track an animal in the field and say, oh, I'm going to meet at that rock, and that's not a good idea. And that became hardwired in our brains. Uh, the difference between myself and my critics is we look at the same world and they apply their linear uh, intuition. 30 steps linearly gets you to 30 and 30 steps ex exponentially gets you to a billion. So it's a very profound difference. But my intuition, like everyone else, is, is linear. So when these things actually happen, like a self-driving car, it seems remarkable to me, even if I wrote about it. Um, but things are tracking pretty pretty well with my uh, predictions. The next question is for me. It says, being the daughter of Ray Kurzweil must be really hard. How do you deal with the pressure? <laughs> it's, that's a funny question because when I think of things that are hard, like, that's not I think of, you know, things that my grandmother went through. Like, that sounds hard, you know. So I think it's nice to have a father I can talk to about intellectual ideas. I think that's actually rare. Um, that feels like a special thing. Like, um, I think there's often a large generation gap between parents, and so, since my father is so future-oriented, I have this nice situation of being able to talk to him about things that matter to me and will, will matter in the future. Um, and how do I deal with the pressure? I don't, I don't know. I like yoga, I guess. <laughs> I don't, don't we all feel pressure? I mean, I don't know. I think that's a pretty normal thing no matter who your parents are, but I have nothing to compare it to. Um, and the next question says, Amy, do you believe what your father says about the future? <laughs> you know, I'm not a futurist. So I think that I, you know, I lack certain tools to evaluate his arguments critically, but it's interesting, it's kind of like, I feel like I grew up as a singularitarian the same way I grew up as a Jew. Like, it's like cultural. Like, I'm a cultural singularitarian. Um, and so, so many of his ideas about the future, I think I just, um, I just maybe took for granted. Like, they weren't surprising to me because they were things that I grew up with. Um, and you know, in recent years, I've been able to think more critically about his ideas, and so many of them do hold up for me. Um, I think perhaps my concern is not evaluating whether or not his predictions will come true, but more about what those predictions will mean for us as humans, um, and especially what it'll mean for our relationships and our identities. And so, um, yeah, I think I do. I think I'm there with his ideas. And um, my concern is, is you know, what, what next? I think we have time for one more. One more? You want to choose? Well, the first one's good. I can't see it. Can you, can you see it? Joe Tseen is proposing that the algorithm for our brain's computation may in fact be very simple. How does this compare with your pattern recognition work? Well, I wrote about, that's actually the theme of my book, How to Create a Mind which is what I talked about last time I was here in 2012. <clears throat> and I do propose an algorithm for the neocortex. Now, the neocortex is, means new rind, and it's a brain region that emerged 200 million years ago <clears throat> with uh, mammals. And uh, 65 million years ago, there was a sudden catastrophic change in the environment, and that region uh, was critical to mammals overtaking their ecological niche at that time. And so then the neocortex grew, mammals got bigger, their brains got bigger at an even faster pace, and the neocortex got bigger even faster than that, developing these curvatures. It's now 80% of the brain. And I give the evidence, there's actually a lot of evidence now coming from the uh, brain reverse engineering projects, for example, the European one, has found evidence of 300 million repeating modules of 100 neurons each. And each of them recognizes a pattern. And it recognizes patterns as inputs come from other, uh, other modules that are lower in the hierarchy. So it's a big hierarchy. We create the hierarchy with our own thinking.
And I describe the algorithm, I describe it as a hidden Markov model after a Russian mathematician, and I give the evidence for this. Uh, and it's not that complicated. And uh, this has been experimented with, and it uh, seems to give good results. Uh, it appears to uh, perhaps solve a problem that these deep neural nets have, which there's a motto, life begins at a billion examples. One of the reasons I'm at Google is we have a billion examples of some things, but for example, dogs and cats, but not everything. Uh, and you know, humans can learn from less information. Your significant other or your boss tells you something once or twice, you might actually learn from that. At least some humans have been reported to do that. Uh, and so I make the case in my book that this actually allows you to learn from less information. Uh, we'll learn more and more about the neocortex as we get more information from reverse engineering the brain. But this is actually a fairly simple model. Uh, it gets its complexity from interacting with a complex environment. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.